us to um, get in our sights to receive it because it's for today. Okay, it's now. And so we're just going to um, go into that and we're going to talk about um, personal preparations for revival and for outpouring. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to walk through it. It's not that we're waiting for the outpouring because we know that he sent the Holy Spirit. He's not sending anything else. He is here. But there's things that we can do, you know, as a people, as a body in this community, in the region where he puts us. There's things that God, um, that God will partner with us and he'll begin to release his spirit. And we'll see, you know, we do see healings. Praise God. We see deliverance. We're not ignorant to miracles and things like that and but we want to see a harvest of souls amen we want to see people saved delivered healed all of those things at a greater capacity than what we've been seeing so god is so good so let's start out we're going to walk we are a um as we say we are a word walking church yes so you're going to get a lot of word today because that's what we do because the word changes us doesn't it it changes us without the word of God. I don't have anything really to say. And so we, we teach the word. So we're going to start first in Joel. Let's go to the book of Joel. God is so good. Chapter 2, verse 28. The promise of the spirit. It says, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Hallelujah. And so that's Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for this word that you have put in my spirit. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would release it, that the people's ears would be open to hear. Their eyes can see what you're saying through the word today. Father, we just thank you for your presence. We, we just thank you, Father, that you're going to speak through these lips of clay today, Father, a word that this body needs to hear and those that came from near and far can receive today in the name of Jesus. And so there are personal uh, preparations that we can do as a as a person because we are the house of God or corporately as a body and so we have you know we've been increasing our prayer and, and God because we are an apostolic center we go out a lot and we do a lot of missions and we do a lot of work um, in different places but how many know that our Jerusalem needs attending to yeah. <laughs> our Jerusalem right here okay and so sometimes when you're uh, apostolic prophetic um, the, the work, the workload is so great and the call to go and God does send us. We don't go unless he sends us, but we have to know and understand that this is our Jerusalem. Okay. And right here in this, in this region and right here in the, the Midwest, there is a need, uh, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is a need for deliverance. There's need for salvations and healings and, and miracles. There's hurting people everywhere, right? Because the truth is, ministry is about souls. It's about people, okay? It's about people, and so it's all about that. And so we want to see not just, and I may say the word revival, but I know revival tends to have a beginning and an end. So we just don't want to see a revival take place, but we want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit where there is a consistent move of God, the river of God, okay? The river of God continues to flow, you know, out of us into the city, into the state, and so forth and so on. And so, but I want to break down some of these words to you today. And so we, we need it personally. We need revived personally, all right? And then we need a corporate revival, okay, or a corporate um, some people use the word awakening. That's fine. I like outpouring better. But either way, this revival, what is the word revival? What does it mean? Revival means it is a, a spiritual rejuvenation and a transformation of believers. <laughs> so we need personal rejuvenation, okay, and personal transformation ourselves. And so we want God just to pour out and to do the things he does. But I'm here to tell you that it comes through us, okay? God visits us with his presence, but what do we do when he comes? 
Are we ready for when he shows up? Are we prepared for what God really wants to do in our communities? You know, are we, are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing, you know, to do this? So revival is the spiritual rejuvenation and a transformation of believers into the image of who? Jesus. You always hear me teach that the model is Jesus. It's the model is Jesus in everything, okay? So it is transforming believers into the image of Jesus through the sustained, manifested presence of God. <laughs> sustained. Okay, we know we house the Holy Spirit. We, we know that. But I'm talking about a movement of the spirit that we as a people, we can sustain it. You can't contain God because God can't be put in a box. Okay, so we're not saying that we've boxed God in. We really are in the box. God is not. But how do we, how do we allow the manifested presence of God, the sustaining power will bring it, the sustaining power brings the outpouring of the holy spirit okay so it's one thing that's why revival when you talk about revival revival sometimes in traditional circles it's maybe three days or we're having a week revival and people come and they're excited about revival and they should be right they're excited about god is coming and he's moving but what about when that time is done what about when the evangelist goes home what happens the next sunday or the next time we gather you see so when god gives us impartations we have to be able to sustain that it take it costs you something we have to sustain the movement of the holy spirit because we know that the holy spirit you know joel prophesied and acts here he was okay so we have to know that the Holy Spirit is sensitive, okay? There are things as a people when we understand that he is the third person of God and that he is sensitive, and we want to be able to um, cultivate, be able, okay, by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, be able to sustain his movement, to hear what he's saying, to see what he's doing. We partner with God. Okay, we're partnering with him. Amen. And so in Psalm 85, 6 says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? So will you not revive us again? So that tells me they were once revived and God had to come back and revive them again. You see? And so there are movements, and you guys can research history. You can see the movements of the, the different uh, dispensations that God released in the, um, you know, he, and the different outpourings of the Holy Spirit that has come into the earth. And there's outpourings right now all over the globe, praise God, that are going on, right? They're going on, and there's movements of the Holy Spirit. And so God loves to visit his people in a special way. He loves to pour out his spirit. He desires that all be saved. He desires that all be healed, that all be delivered, right? And so Psalm 119, 88 says, Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. So we need to keep that, that spirit of being revived, that the continual flow of the Holy Spirit in our life, we need to keep that continually moving so we can testify of God's goodness. So we can testify of what God is doing in the movements of the Spirit. Because mm -hmm. it's contagious, isn't it? Yes. It's contagious. So we need revive to do that. Because how many know that it says in Timothy that the, at the, when this, this right now, where we're at right now, the latter days, right? He talks about how many people's hearts will wax cold, right? And he's speaking to church people. You could say that. He's speaking to the church. He, there's, there's many, many places where they're warning the church about cold love, about being cold and, and getting all of, you know, uh, weighed down with the world and all of those kind of things. So I'm telling you, it takes some work to sustain this flow of the spirit in your life mm -hmm. it does doesn't it it takes some discipline 
It takes having an ear to hear the Spirit of God and being obedient to God. That's the discipline, the obedience to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The sacrifice, there's a sacrifice. Right now, you know, there's people that have paid a price to see healing crusades. Come on now. That didn't just happen at a snap of a finger. These people have prayed and they have they have fasted, they have prayed, they have had a hunger for people to be healed. Okay, they weren't satisfied. They cried out these kind of scriptures, revive us, God. They say things like, Where is? Just like when and we're going to go there in a minute with Elijah and Elijah. But they cried out because they knew that there was more that God had. They knew that there was more that God could do than what they were seeing. And there's many people, they get, they get weary of people coming into church and leaving the same way. So we have to have, we have, to have an understanding today of what, Father, what is it? What are you requiring us as a body uh, as a people to do, to see this beautiful outpouring of the Spirit. Amen. So the spirit of revival begins with the hearts of God's remnant ones. You notice how Jesus talked to masses, and he would say many times, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, right? He who has an ear to hear. Now, Jesus, I promise you, he was loud when he spoke. The anointing on Jesus came out, and people came from all over to receive from Jesus. But even as Jesus was teaching, we know that many couldn't hear what he was saying. That means they didn't have a spiritual ear. They were not in tuned with the words and the, the spirit of Christ, okay? They came for many things to eat and to do the things that they were doing, to get taken care of, to get healed, and all of those things. But he still would say, you have an ear to hear, let him hear. And then, he, and then the disciples, when he got alone with the, with, the, with the remnant 12 of his, you know, he talked plain speech to them. They could hear and understand. He, they received what he was saying. Come on now. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So there is a stirring within a remnant people. Mm -hmm. A stirring of the spirit. There is a stirring within them. There is a cry inside of them. Sometimes the stirring and the cry disturbs your rest. <laughs> Let's tell the truth. You can't sleep at night sometimes because inside of you, the Spirit of God is stirring you up, okay? He's stirring you. He, he's, he's, he's trying to get you to, to hear what he wants to do and what he's saying. And so there is a hunger for the manifested presence of Yeshua Jesus. There's a hunger. We like we read about this God. Where are you? Why don't I see you actively in my life? Where's the God of miracles? Amen. He's here. He's in our midst right now. And so the presence of Jesus, I'm talking about a remnant people, okay? And it first comes through personal repentance and prayer. You want to sustain the movements of the Holy Spirit? Guess what? We have to be a people of repentance. It's so true. It's not a one time I repent and it's over. It's a lifestyle, amen? It's a lifestyle where, where we know when we grieve the Holy Spirit or we know when we do, we're doing things that he doesn't want us to do, we say, Father, forgive me for that. Forgive me for not praying. You know, come on, sins of the church, right? I'm not, I know that we're not, you know, I'm not saying that we're all a bunch of sinners in here. I know we've been saved, we've been bought and blood washed, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about these church things that sometimes church people do. They get offended sometimes. That's unrighteous, unrighteous things, offenses and, and bitterness and anger. And, and sometimes there's uh, jealousy in churches. Sometimes there's all kinds of these little things, the works of the flesh, right? And so we have to live a lifestyle of repentance to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit because God is and will forever be a holy God. It's true. So God shows up and he comes in our midst in some places, God comes to the door. I'm just going to say it, but he can't habitate with them. He can't stay in that place 
because things are not the, the the gospel is not really being preached of repentance people people aren't being stirred to good works okay there the truth is not being released from the pulpits let's tell the truth and so just because gatherings are big doesn't mean God is in the midst and there's an outpouring of the spirit of God okay I'm here to tell you because you can have big gatherings and I'm not against that we need we need more people coming to Christ but if our purpose is just to gather and it's not about his presence then we've missed something amen and so we need the spirit of revival in our hearts. We need it burning. And so the spirit of revival neither will be ignited or sustained without personal and corporate prayer. And this prayer I'm talking about is repentance too. All of that goes together. Repentance prayer. There's different kinds of prayer, and that's not my message today, but there's different kinds of prayer. But it, it's, it will not be ignited or sustained. And so corporate and personal prayer has to become a priority, okay? And so prayer for a remnant people that wants to see an outpouring and wants to see a continual movement of the spirit, it has to become a priority in our life. It's not a, if I have time or if I can get up. No, I got time and I'm getting up. Yes. There's, it's not an option. Do you understand? It's not an option if we want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. See, these are, these are basic blocks here. This is not a deep word. These are basic uh, foundational blocks or keys to see an outpouring in your life. It's, that's, it, that's it right there. Jesus is the model for revival, right? He's the model for, the, for, for how, he, how he lived under an open heaven. Jesus didn't want for nothing. You know, even when he prayed out loud, you remember when he was, when he, uh, Lazarus was coming out of the tomb, you know, he said, Father, I know that you hear me and you hear me always, but for their sakes, I'll say it out loud. I'm paraphrasing. That's what he did. He said, I'm, he, he released that prayer for him for out loud, but I'm telling you, he already knew it was done because Jesus had this oneness with Abba. He had this oneness with his father, and the Bible says that he, he even told Mary, remember, I am the resurrection and the life. Don't you believe? And then the, when they came running about his friend being dead, he was not moved. He stayed an extra day there. Come on now, because he already knew he was alive, that he was coming alive. Amen? So Jesus is the model. He is the example. He made personal prayer to his father a priority. A couple examples, Mark 135. Now in the morning, having risen a long a while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there Jesus prayed. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? He had to get up early because of the demand that was on him, right? And so he would get up before the day, set his day in prayer, Look what happened in his life. Luke 6, 12, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. See, God will give us times to pray. We have corporate times. They had it in Acts, and we're going to read about that. And then there's personal times that the Holy Spirit will speak to you individually to get before God. Mm-hmm. And I just believe because we are sensitive to the leading, Isaiah 56, let's go there, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that watches will be covered. There's different prayer watches. Watches will be covered, so the house will be covered, not just, not just our personal house, but uh, the corporate house, and then the community, and, and God can begin to flow out of these, as we say, these four walls into the community. So Isaiah 56, that was the desire that Jesus had for his church. Isaiah 56, verse 7, it says, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. 
burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples or as some versions say all nations hallelujah right so he says my house will be a house of prayer for all nations and guess what jesus repeated that in matthew he quoted the prophet in matthew 21 in 21 13 you remember the story here when jesus was cleansing the temple here it says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. So they were not, they weren't using the house, God's house for what it was intended to be used for. They began to, they were marketing in that house. They were making profit in the house. Okay. They had really lost sight of what the house was about. So Jesus says to them in verse 13, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He says, but you're making it a robber's den. Mm. And then miracles happened after that, and you can continue reading that. But So our personal temple must be a house of prayer before we can build a corporate house of prayer that will position ourselves for the outpouring that God has allotted to us as a people. Oh, boy. You mean that's on us? Yes. It is. It is. Why? Because you have spiritual understanding. We're not ignorant to the schemes of the devil. Okay? We, we are not ignorant to those things. So God, God desires us to partner with him to see the movement of the Spirit of God like we have never seen it before. Amen? Come on now. So our personal temples, that's why we do all these cleansings. That's why people get set free in deliverance and deliverance. And we deal with personal issues and things and strongholds and all of that. That's why we do this consistently. And people come here just to get set free. Why? Because it's not offered in these other places. Okay? Because they don't have a revelation of those things. Because we believe in the fullness of Jesus. Everything Jesus did, we believe. That it's for us today. Everything. Amen. So without prayer, there is no hunger. I want you to see that. There is no change. There's no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. People will still gather. Doors will open and, and all of those things. And people may have a good time and hear a good message. But to see an outpouring happen... It's going to take some sacrifice from us, okay? And remember, God just needs a remnant, people. If I had a piece of material and I tore a remnant off the material, I just tore a little piece, <laughs> right? He didn't need the whole thing. He just needs a remnant, and you are that. And so without the supernatural power of God flowing, there's no change for souls to be saved, there's no changes in our families or our communities. It takes the power and the presence of God to bring a change, okay? Because all the other things will be temporal. So it takes the power and the presence of God. And without, without an outpouring, you know, we can maintain and we continue to exist, but those that are hungry are going to want more. Come on now. Those that are hungry are going to desire more, the more of God. Why? Because he said we could have it. He said he, we could have the more of God. Amen? He said we could have it. But see, people, if you don't know you can have a promise or if you don't know that, that God has a gift for you, you can't receive that gift. You've got, to, you've got to believe that you can have what he said you can have. If you have unbelief and you doubt that God has these things for you, you're not going to get them. Even though he paid the price and he's released his spirit and he's given us keys. Come on. He's given us access, authority to receive the things he has for us. So every major outpouring of the spirit was birthed through months and years even of sustained. Now you need to hear that sustained sacrificial intercession by a faithful few. Oh, boy. It's not too hard. 
I just heard that. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit. See, he's the fire. He's the presence. He's the passion. He's everything. He's love. <laughs> and so if you say, well, I need, I need more love in my life. Holy Spirit, help me to love. Holy Spirit, I need more hunger. Holy Spirit, light a hunger in me for souls. Holy Spirit, help me to, to desire an outpouring in the community. Guess what? He'll begin to stir you up because that's his desire. Holy Spirit, we want to see children saved. We want to see, we want to see a movement in our children. Help me, Holy Spirit, to pray. Show me how to pray effectively. He will. But do you ask him those kind of questions? In 2 Chronicles, let's go to 2 Chronicles, and then we're going to go to Acts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Stir us up, Father. Stir us up. Open our hearts to receive what you're saying today, because you have more for us than what we can see, what we can imagine. You have a desire to pour out your spirit like never before. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, Solomon. It says, Now Solomon, the son of David, established himself securely over his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and exalted him greatly. Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and hundreds, and to the judges and to every leader in all Israel, the heads of the father's households. Verse 3, Then Solomon and all the assembly went with him to the high place, which was at Gibeon, for God tent of meeting was there which Moses the servant of the Lord had made in the wilderness hmm. so let's keep on walking we're going to go somewhere else so there there you read that so I'm setting what God was doing here Solomon builds a temple let's go to chapter 7 let's fast forward here talks about the glory of God filling the temple Mm -hmm. There was an order how God told Solomon to build it, and he obeyed and did just what God said. Okay, even in chapter 5, verse 11, it says, A priest came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions. It talks about the singers. It talks about how they dressed and the, the instruments they used and, and how they worked the altar and how they blew the trumpets, the unison of the trumpeters and the singers, and, and all of those things came together. <laughs> it was glorious. Right? Everybody had something that God gave them to do to complete this temple and to, so that the glory of God would be released. And verse six, uh, 14 says, so that the priests, all of these things came together. And it says in verse, let me go here to verse 13. In unison, when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord. And then they lifted up their voice accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music. And then they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go to chapter 7. Look what happens here in 712. Okay, so sacrifices were offered there was a feast of dedication this this is a, a beautiful picture here in verse 11 it says thus solomon finished finished the house of the lord in the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the lord and in this palace then the lord appeared to solomon at night and said to him i have heard your prayer now look at that and i have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice he said if i shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or if i command the locusts to devour my the land or or if i send pestilence among my people now look what he tells him to do. And my people who are called by my name 
humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. He said, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that's been offered in this place. He said, for now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. That's beautiful right there. So God showed us. He put all these things together as God commanded and told him to do. He was obedient to do what God directed him to do in Chronicles right here, to build this temple. And then he goes on and he tells them there's, there's, a, there's the promise but the warning, right? There's a warning about, about humility. There's a warning about repentance that's continual, a continual repentance and staying under uh, the hand of God. And so we know that this is a type and shadow, and we know Jesus said, look, I'm not going to be in, in buildings anymore. He says, my spirit's going to be put in people. He says, I'm going to put my spirit in them. I'm going to give them a new spirit, a new heart, mm -hmm. and I will abide with him forever. So you're walking around. You are the temple of God. Mm -hmm. You are the temple that houses God's spirit. Mm-hmm. You got to maintain that temple. <laughs> you got to maintain the temple, don't you? You got to keep yourself right. Come on. You you've got to spend time with God. You've got to you've got to cultivate the presence of God. I mean, they were so sensitive about everything being the way God wanted it to be. Mhm. Mm and when they did, guess what? The glory showed up. Sure did. It sure did. The glory showed up because they were obedient to do what God was telling them. Amen? All through the book of Acts. So we know in Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts now. Walking this thing out here. Prayer and repentance. So the Holy Spirit comes. There's a great, there's an outpouring because Jesus told his disciples, said, look, you're going to wait the day of Pentecost I'm going to send my spirit, right? And so Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves and resting on each one of them. And they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with new tongues. Thus, here's the church is birthed. Hallelujah. It is birth. So now we're all the church. We're the temple of the living God. Come on now. We are the temple that houses the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We are. We are him. We, we have him in us, and we release him into what? Into the earth, right? Amen. So we got to look at this temple here, and we got to see what's blocking the flow. Is there a hunger in me? Is there a desire for the more of God? Am I being obedient to the things he has, he has called me to do, right? Am I preparing for this outpouring? Do I expect to see something, or am I just going to continue to live the way I'm living and do what I'm doing? Have we prepared for the rain? Hmm. Come on. Let's think about it. This is, this is to stir us up today. We, we need to consider some things. It says God will always use a remnant to do the birthing of an outpouring. He will always do that. So we know that we have had many uh, words, prophetic words, spoken over this church, okay, over, over us. Many beautiful things that God has come in and he has released to us as a body about the outpouring, about a move of his spirit. He has released that about all. I mean, we've had many visions. We've had dreams. So do we see it? Can we see what God has been saying to us as a body? Can we really see it? Do you believe what the prophets have said? He said if we believe the prophets, guess what? We will prosper. We'll be blessed if we believe the prophets, right? And so the glory of the Lord filled the temple when they did as God instructed, the presence of God is evidenced by the glory cloud. 
Come on. It's evident when we know when he's here, we can feel his presence, right? The cloud will manifest in his holy temple, which is us in, in the people when we come together. It was just glorious today, right? We'll come together. He is, he is here, but there's something greater. And so this in Solomon's temple of the Old Testament foreshadows the glory that shall be rising in churches now and today. And it is many places. Okay. God is outpouring throughout the whole world. And he desires more of that. He desires just the world to be full, right? Because the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's, right? And the fullness thereof. Come on. So the book of Acts lived in a continual outpouring. We always say that we, we do our best as we know to be the church of Acts. We do. And we're still growing and learning as we walk this thing out. But, but we believe in that. We believe that that is a model that the church should be. We should be like that. We should, we should ask the Holy Spirit, how do we be like that? Because that was, that was what you desired, Jesus. That is what you birthed in, in the beginning was this church right here, the Acts church. And so in Acts 3.19, you see this first message here in 3.19, Peter's, actually Peter's second sermon while he was clinging to Peter and John. Well, let's go down to verse, um, verse 19. Peter preaches, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So God is still restoring things because Jesus hasn't come back yet. He's still in the restoration business. Amen. Amen. He's still working things. He's still, he's still moving in the earth and restoring our, thank God, our families, right? He's restoring people's lives. He's putting things in order for the bride to be ready. Hallelujah. And so he preached, repent, return, and be refreshed. Hmm. And they did that all through Acts Church. And you see the movement of the Holy Spirit that continued to flow. They received from Jesus everything that they needed, and then they were endued with power like Jesus, and they were like him in the earth. They did just what he, they said he told them to do. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will bring a refreshing to God's people. It's a refreshing when he, you know that when, he, when he's moving and he's flowing. It's refreshing when people get set free. <laughs> it's re refreshing isn't it when people get healed you all know you've tasted and seen that the lord is good you've tasted him you know second corinthians three eighteen. you can write that down it says but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord and so there is a special glory that God is releasing in the earth right now. Amen. It's, a, it's for now. He changes us from glory to glory. And so we need this latter day outpouring right here. Amen. We need to get hungry for that. We need to get hungry for the glory that we are supposed to be uh, a part of and being released into our regions, into the nations. Come on. In Acts 2.42, we see the book of Acts, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit produced um, widespread spiritual transformation. All through Acts, you see widespread spiritual transformation through continued prayer. Mm. wasn't just a one time. It was a continuous thrust. <laughs> It's a continuous thrust because the enemy hates outpourings and, and revival and people wakening up, you know. So he's going to hinder and he's going to try and block and he's going to try and bring distractions and all of those things. Come on, you know, he's going to try and bring offense, things like that into God's people because he knows it will hinder them and they cannot receive what he has for them. Because the devil can't take you, but he can hinder you. He can block you. 
Okay, he's a thief. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Come on. But there was a continual prayer breaking of bread. That's Acts 242. That's our, um, that's our, what do you call it, mission statement right here. We, that's what we use in our church. They were continuing together, Acts 242. People joined the vision of the Lord for the house. That's, that's how you join. You just, God called you here and you joined the vision. And it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And it says everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, look at that, continuing with one mind in the temple and they were breaking bread from house to house and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart and they were praising God. And having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So it wasn't just a one-time meeting, okay? It was a continual celebration of Jesus, okay? Come on now. It was a continual talking about the goodness of God. It was a continual time of prayer. It was a a being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the needs of one another. Mm Mm-hmm. See, that's, I'm telling you, where there's, where there's unity like that and there's love and unity, God commands blessing life forevermore. And so we are the living church. Mm-hmm. Church means you're the ecclesia. That means you are the called out ones from the world into God's kingdom. <laughs> you're it. Okay? Praise God for that. And so Acts 2.42 You see how simple it was. Why do we make it so hard? It was was a simple what they were doing, but there was a sacrifice that was involved. Acts 114, another scripture, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Uh Uh-huh. So that's prayer and supplication. So there's times in prayer, and we know that, where God will come on us, and there's travail, and there's a birthing, and there's an intercession that comes upon us. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Let him move through you like that. Someone else might be over here in, in their time of prayer and when we come together, and they could be in a, a laid-out place over there, okay? That's the beauty of the liberty of the Holy Spirit, We have to allow him liberty to flow through his people because everybody has something to contribute when God is moving in such a way. Come on. Everybody has something in them. There's burdens. There's supplication. There's there's praise. There's thanksgiving. There's many, many ways, uh, petitions. There's things that can be going on in prayer. Okay? But it all, when we're a We do this personally in our own time as the Holy Spirit comes upon us to pray, whatever hour it is. Come on now. Jesus told his disciples, can you give me one hour? Come on now. Just one. If it's 10 o'clock, if it's 11 o'clock, if it's midnight, if it's 6 a.m., just give me an hour. Right? Come on. We need to look at that. Don't raise your hand or nothing. But we need to look at that. (laughs) Come on. Just one hour. And sometimes we try too hard, like we want to jump over here in a 10-hour prayer. We're going to pray for five, 10 hours, you know. And you, you, I'm telling you, just begin right there. Begin right there because that's the obedience to Jesus right there. He said it. They wrote it in there for us. Come on. When you begin there and then, you, and then as you continue to do and be obedient with the one hour, whatever hour it is that he speaks to you. Some people think, well, you know, if you don't get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not spiritual. That's, don't listen to that spirit. That's a religious spirit. Your hour might be 11 o'clock at night when everybody else is sleeping. Come on now. And so sometimes in church, which we're kingdom, but sometimes in church, you know, people get... Um, they start judging each other about stuff like that. That's not unity and love right there. Come on now. We got to keep that stuff out. You got to keep that out. We want outpouring. Come on. 
we're not going to be judging one another by how we pray. There are sometimes people don't even want to take the mic because they don't pray like so-and-so or this one or that one. No, you have an anointing. Amen, you have an anointing. You remember uh, the gathering we had where we had all the, the different nations that came and I had them all pray in their own tongue, their native tongue. And wow, God was so happy with that. And as they were praying, it was so powerful. You know, the, the Dene were praying in their Navajo tongue. And we, have, we had Jorge. He's like, me? <laughs> I gave, you know, Jorge. I said, pray in Spanish. You know, so, and he, he was a little bit, you know. But boy, once he opened his mouth, that was all to, you know, and fire came. Come on now. We had somebody that was from Jamaica pray. We, had, we just like, I said, pray. You know, why? Because it's the sound of the Lord. He said, my, my, my house will be a house of prayer for nations. I'm telling you, we have to see it like that. If we can't see it, we can't have it. If you can't see it, you say, well, I don't know how to sing in Spanish. Sing in the spirit. I don't know those words. It don't matter. <laughs> you can feel the spirit of God. You can feel the spirit of God. That's why we do even African songs. Come on now. Because we're kingdom. And so we're, we're singing, but it's going deeper. It's going further than here in Troy, Missouri. It's, it's impacting the spirit realm. I'm telling you, you're going to see some things. You're going to experience some things because God has given me a tenacity in the spirit. And we're going to see what God said we could have. Amen? So don't question those things. Just get in and flow. Amen? Acts 3.1. It says, now when Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour of prayer... <laughs> Now, look what happened. They were obedient. They're going up to the temple at the ninth hour of prayer. Now, these men were so full of power in the Holy Ghost, but they still were obedient to what? Prayer. That's what was sustaining them. It was the prayer. Come on now. And he says, and the man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And it says, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And he seized him by the right hand. He raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. And so he, with a leap, he stood upright. He begins to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And guess what? They were taking note of him. Oh, boy. That's that man. That, how did that man get up? How did that beggar walk? Come on now. What did it happen? That's an outpouring. Come on now. The, the, the outpouring of the Spirit flowed because of their obedience. He could have walked right on by and went right in there. But Peter wouldn't do that because he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? We miss opportunities. And I believe we miss the opportunities because we haven't been cultivating and listening to Holy Spirit and being sensitive to him. Because opportunities are everywhere. Uh-huh. They're everywhere. And so help us, Holy Spirit, because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, things are shifting. Acts 4.31, hallelujah, it says, and while, let's go up to verse 29, you remember um, the story here, there was any time that there is a movement, there's always persecution, you know that, all through the Acts church, every time the power of God flowed, guess what happened? Here comes the religious people or people were against them just like they were with Jesus. Jesus warned us these would happen, but it didn't stop them. Okay, so whenever we set our hearts to, to see this outpouring, some people ain't going to like it. They already don't like us anyway, but it doesn't matter because we love them. Amen. We love them. And so 429 
it says, and now take note of their threats. This is a prayer, okay? This is a prayer because they were arrested. All these things were happening here. And it says, and now the Lord, he's praying, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with what? Boldness. That's why you pray too. It gives you boldness. <laughs> the more that we pray, the more that we cultivate the presence of God, we get bold. It's not a prideful arrogance. It's a boldness and a courage of the Spirit. It's very different, okay? It's a different because it is the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus taught them how to pray. So these, these um, apostles, his disciples, who birth, they birthed this work here, the church, and he, he was their model, their example, so they stuck with the model. And that's so very important as followers of Jesus that we stay with the model of Christ. Amen? So they were fully submitted to Jesus, and they became like him. So you know the stories, and you see all the stuff that they went through to get discipled. You know, and many people, when Jesus would tell them what was required of them, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. You know, I'm not just going to feed you fish and bread here. You're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, see you, Jesus. Too much. <laughs> see you. True. You read about it. They, they say, ah, we don't want all of you like that. We just want to get something from you, but we don't want to. We don't want all of you. Okay, we don't want to do that. Who, who can do that, right? And so, but his disciples, they did that. They went through what it took to see this right here. They, they paid a price, you see. And so many times in the Western church, the, the Western church doesn't like the cost of the oil or the cost of an outpouring. They just want it right now. Just give me, give me, give me. And God's like, uh-uh, there's, there's a way here. There's something I'm requiring of you, okay? There's something, but you will have the grace when you say yes. See, when you say yes, there's a grace that's empowered every time that I'm in a hard place or a place where I feel like, Lord, this is hard. But if I say yes to him, he empowers me. Mm -hmm. He empowers me. That's called grace. Yeah, but I have to give him my yes. And you're no, nobody is, everybody is the same way. We all got to come that way. And so they were transformed. They went through the process of transformation and received the keys to the kingdom. Matthew 16. See, he didn't give them the keys right up front, did he? <laughs> no. It'd be like trying to give your child the keys to your car, and they don't, they've never drove before. So they had to learn of him. They had to walk through some things. They had to go. Sometimes he had corrected them. Sometimes he, he, you know, he had to continually teach them by example, by serving and loving and doing all the things that the world, even in their day, the religious people, he had to, he had to go against all of those things and create and make this, show them the new wine. This is, this is new to you. You know, you've been, you had the old, but now there's new. I'm here. And I'm showing you and I'm teaching you, you know, what it's going to take for you to evangelize the world. Come on now. He said, I'm leaving, but I'm sending the power. I'm sending what you need, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be everything that you need. So they went through the process of transformation. They didn't reject him. They went through the process, so even though it was hard. And Peter, you remember Peter. He's one of the great examples of how, how grieved he was. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know, everything he boasted in pride, you know, this, those things God did later. But the boasting and all the stuff that God had to do to him, but nonetheless, he finished his course. Hallelujah. He made it. Amen. And he was everything that he boasted, but he did it with humility. <laughs> Amen. And so in Matthew 16, 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some say John the Baptist, the others Elijah. He said, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Then Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He said, I'm going to give you keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And that's Acts 16, 13 through 19. So here, the revelation, he says, you're gonna, I'm going to build my church on the, on the rock. That means the revelation that I am the Christ. Hallelujah, that I'm the king. I'm going to build my people. Mm -hmm. My called out ones are going to be built on the rock. Mm. They're going to be built on the revelation of Jesus, all that he was, all that he is. Amen. The Christ, the son of the living God. And so this was that new wineskin that Jesus kept talking to them about. He said, the spirit of God is coming. I'm going to send him to you. I'm leaving. I'm going to send the spirit, the spirit of Christ. His Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to be in you and rest upon you. And, and all this time, he was telling them what? Greater work shall you do. You can turn that air up a little bit. Greater work shall you do, <laughs> right? Because I'm going to the Father. Greater. Amen? Hallelujah. That's us. <laughs> And so the Acts church was, uh, was mantled, and I'm almost through. I know it's a little lengthy today, but the Acts church was mantled with the spirit of revival, you could say, or a, a continual outpouring. There was a mantle on them of the spirit, and they tended to that mantle. They took care of that mantle. They, did, they didn't take it for granted. They honored and feared God. See, the fear of God will keep them on you. I'm telling you what, the fear of God will keep the tangible presence of the Lord with you. Mm -hmm. What is the fear of God? I am in all of him. I revere him. I say no to sin. I'm, I'm not going to grieve him. I'm not going to walk. Uh, I'm going to be serious about what he has spoken to me. When he speaks, I'm going to obey because I reverence him. I, I have a holy fear of God. And I understand, see, mature ones that eat and drink Jesus they understand that they have a responsibility from the king. Because remember, we're in the kingdom, right? And so the king, kingdom has the king. So the Acts church was mantled with that kind of attitude, with that kind of anointing. There was a spiritual rejuvenation and a transformation of people into the image of Christ all through that book. They were changed. Mm -hmm. People got born again changed amen it was a continuing outpouring and outpouring of the holy spirit continual process and so you could you could say that a mantle is like a robe or a cloak of the spirit you hear a lot sometimes people teach about mantles right it is a robe or a cloak of the spirit and you know when it comes upon you you can feel the spirit of god come upon you Sometimes you will feel him come upon you, and you need to release a prophetic word. Mm. Yeah, you can feel that. And sometimes the Spirit of God will come on you, and you feel deliverance. Like I know when we do mass deliverances, I, can, I know when the mantle is present. He's there. I feel him. I know he's there. And every mantle feels different according to what God has called you to do. The gifts and the callings of God, they're different, right? But it's all Jesus. And so you know when he's present. It's like a robe or a cloak of the spirit, okay? And it, it, it authorizes and empowers believers to serve in a ministerial or a governing capacity. They're all different. And you see them spoken about in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The prophets had certain mantles they wore. Everybody knew they were a prophet. And I find it interesting when um, Samuel came back up, you know, to give judgment on Saul. You know, they saw an old man with a mantle. And immediately they knew that it was, it was him who it was. It was the prophet Samuel. You see that? And so those things can clearly be seen in the spirit realm. They can be seen. We may not see it unless God opens our eyes, and sometimes we do see things like that. But 
but it's the power and the presence of the Spirit. And so they're given and released by God through the Holy Spirit to bless the body of Christ and to build the kingdom of God. And so they authorize and they anoint the fivefold, Ephesians 4, the fivefold governing uh, body, governing body of God to serve and to govern the people. And the Acts Church followed that, didn't they? Mantles also empower the saints to operate in spiritual gifts. Okay, so I'll probably pause right there. I'm going to talk about this anointing and then and then we'll just close for today because this is going to be more than a one Sunday message here. And so, and you're talking about when the anointing comes upon you, right? And we know that we have received an anointing from the Holy Spirit. He's in us. We are anointed. But there's special times when that anointing comes upon you. Okay, and as you continue to walk with the Lord and you're growing in the things of the Spirit, you'll, you'll feel and you'll be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you. Some people have an anointing we know to sing or, or to lead worship, an anointing to do instruments. David, look at that anointing, right? He was a worshiper, a warrior, and he had an anointing from God. He was a king, of course, but, but there was an anointing that would come upon him when Saul was tormented. Mm-hmm. And that anointing came upon him as he played the harp and demons left him. That didn't happen just because he knew how to play the harp. There was an anointing that came over him. Come on. So the anointing is the ability to do something, and the authority is an operating influence through relationships. So because I have this relationship with Jesus and I'm filled with his spirit, he has anointed me to do something. You're no different. Everybody has an anointing to do something, more than one thing, really. But when there's gifts and things inside of you, you're going to begin to discover those because we're talking about, you know, this outpouring. Like, we need our gifts moving and flowing in this body. Amen? We need it. And so the word anoint means to smear or to rub with oil, to ceremonially confer a divine or holy office upon a priest or a monarch by smearing with oil. This can be, this can come through the impartation of the spirit through revelation, communion. That's your prayer. Come on. Revelation. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on the revelation, on the rock, right? And it comes through communion, which is your prayer, but not just your prayer, but participation. It has to be activated by doing. You remember Jesus, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me too. He didn't just let the spirit of the Lord rest upon him. He did something with the spirit of God, right? He, we know what he did. He went around doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil for God was with him. We know he did all the miracles that Jesus did. John says he can't even, there's not enough paper to write down all the things that Christ did. And so when you're talking about that, it is, it is the presence and impartation. It's, it's like God himself just rubbed you with oil. He just said, this is my child. And he just smeared that anointing on you to do something for him, to bring him glory in the earth. Amen. That should make you happy. You should be excited about that. Uh-huh. So we as believers, we carry an anointing of the spirit. Okay. But we need the power present upon us to do the works of Jesus. It's interesting. He says, um, you, the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus to do something. You remember, um, it says that the power, and I think it's Luke 5, when Jesus was gathered, it said the power and the presence of the Lord was there. Okay? How do you, how do you keep that? It's maintaining. It's the prayer. It's the worship. It's the obedience to Jesus because you just never know when God's going to speak to you to do something. And so we need to see this, and I'm going to stop for today, but we need to experience this. We need to get a vision, and I'll continue on with it another time. But when Elijah and Elijah, we're going to talk all about that, about when that mantle was, was came, and he's, remember he wanted a double portion, but he said if the whole story, he said, if you can see, if you can see it, you can see me when I'm taken up out of here. 
you can have what you ask. You see what I'm saying here? You got to be able to see. You got to be able to see this outpouring. You got to be able to see yourself being used in such a way that you never thought you could be used like that. You got to see what God is speaking to you. You got to see the harvest. Mm -hmm. You got you to be able to see. And so I'm just going to pray that God, that there's an anointing that is released on those that are here. Okay, let's just begin to pray right where we're at. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you have your prayer language, just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you're moving in this body and you're moving in the midst of those that have an ear to hear and a heart to receive what you have for them, Father. I thank you right now, Holy Spirit. Father, there's some opportunities and some things that I just hear, hear in the Holy Spirit. There's some opportunities and some things that have been missed. Just because of disobedience or fear, those kind of things, those, those fleshly things. But I just hear the Lord say that he's going to give you another opportunity. In the name of Jesus. And when the spirit of the Lord begins to ascend and he begins to come upon you, you will obey when he speaks to you. Father, I ask that you would give them I salve, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they can see as you see. That even now, Father, you show them the things that you have predestined them to do, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you right now that you're opening eyes. Because God says, I have more for you. I have more for this house. I have more for those that have come today. I hear him say, come and dine at my table. You can eat as much as you can handle. Come and dine. He said, Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear my presence, but just begin to entertain and, and love my presence. Just begin to, to spend time with me. Ask me things and I will answer you. But he says, come to me with the right spirit. Come to me humble. Humble yourself in my presence. And I will lift you up. See, when your head hangs down low, he's the lifter of your head. He already loved you when he saved you. He loved you before you knew him. And he had a plan for your life. He had a plan for your life. That's it. Just press in. Come on. There's some impartations, and you're going to feel some mantling of, a, of the Holy Spirit. Don't resist him, but just resist receive him. Some of you have been holding back. God said, don't hold back. Young people, this is for you too. Stacy, there's a mantle for you to dance. Come on. There's mantles. Those mantles have assignments. To bring me glory in the earth. We thank you right now, Holy Spirit. We receive it. There's an anointing for certain nations. There's an anointing for creative miracles. Do you want it? There's an anointing for healing cancer. Come on. There's an anointing to cast out devils. There's an anointing to operate in the gifts. There's that anointing. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you. 
you, Holy Spirit. We don't want you to pass this church by. We invite you to habitate in this place. We invite you to be with us. We welcome your presence. We welcome you in this place. And if you know you've resisted him, you just say, forgive me for resisting you. We just welcome you in this place. Come, sweet Holy Spirit. Revive us again. Revive us again. We need it. We need to see what the prophets have been saying. Come on. Open your eyes. You have a part to play. You don't want to stand before God and see all the missed opportunities you could have had. You say, well, how do you know he's going to do that? Because the believer has to go through a judgment too. We thank you, Father. I want to hear you did good. You did good. We thank you right now. We thank you, Father. We don't want to limit the Lord. We don't want to limit the Lord in our life. It's not worth it. Whatever it is, just lay it down. We don't want to limit the movement of God. If it ain't worth it, come on now. It ain't worth it. You don't know what they've done to me. It ain't worth it. We don't want to limit anything that God wants to give us. We release that. We release wrong thinking about ourselves. Uh-huh. And I heard this the other day. One of the things that hinders God's people is that they look at themselves. And they begin to judge themselves by the flesh instead of by the spirit. They begin to look at their inadequacies. They look at their appearance or they look at what they don't have. They begin to look at this external bodysuit that's going to go back to the earth. Come on. And so many, t- many times God puts, and he does, he says he puts these treasures in earthen vessels the treasures he's put a treasure in us he's put a treasure in us so that people will know it's God (laughs) that he gets glorified a treasure in this earthen vessel just a treasure y'all you're a treasure unto the Lord and he's put so much in you don't ever say that you have an ugly soul Don't ever say things like that. Don't ever measure yourself by their past. Don't measure yourself by that. Well, you don't know what I've done. God already washed you. (laughs) He chose to put the treasure in there. He's the king. He's the king and the creator. So if he chose to put that beautiful jewel inside that little piece of clay that nobody can... Nobody cares about. Come on. Earthen vessel. Just, just, a, just, a, just a vessel. Just an earthen vessel here. A piece of clay. A piece of dirt. But God does because he, he put that treasure in there. So I'm telling you, you need to receive what God has for you. Don't limit God by your personal life, your past, who you are, where you come from. Mm-hmm. Remember, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Ha, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> come on think about it can anything good come out of troy missouri oh yeah there's a lot of treasure here yeah. treasures everywhere come on now treasures amen so we bless god today we seal that in our hearts this word today father we just seal it in the hearts and if you're here and you have never been born again then you have never received jesus And I think everybody here is born again. But if you're watching and you have never received the Lord, or if you want to make a fresh dedication to Jesus, you just, you call upon the Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the Lord shall be saved. And so right where you're at, you receive Christ. You ask him to come in, to forgive you, to wash you of your sins. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why the Father sent Jesus, so he could redeem us back in relationship with him. And so if you're here today and you've never received Christ, the greatest miracle you will ever have is Jesus. Amen. The greatest treasure. (laughs) 
And so, Father, we thank you today. We just bless the people today and everything that you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen.